Okay, so I guess the recording has started. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so that's the agenda for today. So before we actually start with the content, I just want some high level high understanding level. about your background, your like what you have done and what all things you know already so that I can lay out my session over here. So, so uh, we are all <laughs> BTEC graduates and okay. uh, we haven't graduated yet. We were all placed uh, in last like around last year. So it's been like three, four, five months and we joined in January last week. And uh, yeah, so that's about us. And uh, if I if I can request, sorry to just deep in. Uh, if I can request if we are speaking, can we have our cameras on? That will be good for uh, socket to interact uh, and look at who is he speaking to. All right, thanks, Urmila. Saket, if you can also have your camera on, that will help. I, I understand in case if there are network issues, you can uh, switch that off, but then having the camera on will help a few. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe after the first break, I would be able to switch on the camera. The reason is uh, the laptop which I'm using is having some issues with the camera built into it. I need to change the laptop. So with after the break, I'll do that. OK, so. I believe uh, it is almost the same background everyone is having over here. Right, Urmila? Mostly, yes, I guess. And so. what is the stream? Is it uh, com science? Computer science and IT. I don't know if somebody is from the ECM electronics branch as well, if they could yeah. let us know. No, right. I guess more, we are computer science and IT background, all of us. Okay. Okay. No, I'm from EC. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, that's great, actually. So I believe uh, just a couple of people might be there from EC uh, background or non com science background, right? Uh, no worries, we will be starting with everything right from the basics. And if you feel that you're not able to understand anything or uh, you need more input on that, you can just stop me anytime and we can discuss in detail as well. Right? Uh, I believe this is the first training uh, you are attending after joining. Yes. And uh, if you have uh, seen the agenda, one thing you may have noticed, it is not going to be complete deep dive kind of training over here. Uh, so the overall learning process will require uh, you guys to put in a little bit of efforts from your side, where I'll be playing the guide role and uh, we'll be focusing on actually learning the end to end development of an application over here instead of focusing entirely on the technology only. What all important things uh, with respect to the technology are there? That is where our focus is going to be. And then I'll be sharing enough material for you guys to drill down and learn in depth about that specific platform or that specific technology. So efforts from both ends will be there. I'll be doing my best to make you understand everything what we are uh, planning over here in the next two to three weeks. And uh, from your side, little bit of extra self study will be required and it's good that uh, we are starting mid of the week so we are getting the advantage of having some weekends in between where actually you can go in and utilize the weekends to uh, do a complete deep dive kind of uh, uh, learning into all the uh, technology platforms that we are going to touch upon make sense once you know the crux, once you know the core things, it is definitely going to be helpful for you to explore further, right? The initial path I am going to show you with 
our approach, with our plan, basically you are going to see a finished application. So you'll get the feel also exactly what kind of applications we build and what kind of uh, uh, development strategies are required. How do we write the code? How do we structure the code? And then the basic things, the theoretical things you can definitely explore. OK. So shall we start? Now again, before starting with the actual agenda, we just need to verify whether we do have the right setup on our machines or not. As there are a few things uh, we will be trying out practically. Most of the things, in fact, we are going to try out practically. So let's verify whether we do have the right environment configured or not. OK, so I would request one of you to share your screen. I believe the setup on all the machines must be the same. So. OK, I, I can share my screen if that's yeah, OK. Yeah, please go ahead, please go ahead. OK. So Urmila, just go to start menu and uh, look for if you have SQL Server Management Studio installed. I don't think so. OK, so do you have uh, SQL. Visual Studio installed? Yeah, I do have that. Visual Studio installed. And Visual Studio. Open, OK, open. I would request everyone else to check out the same thing. You can say open. Or continue without code, in fact. There is a link. And uh, then go to view menu. And select server explorer. Fifth item from top. Okay. Okay. Then uh, there is a servers option. Mm -hmm. Right click on that. <coughs> I'm sorry. Right click on servers. And uh, select add server. OK, this is going to be just the machine. Just cancel this. In that same server explorer window, there is a button with the database icon. I believe the third button it is. This one, right? Uh, no, no, connect yeah. to database. Connect to database. Just click that. Yeah, select Microsoft SQL Server. And click continue. Do I need to give a name? Uh, yes, so in server name, uh, uh, type. Type uh, within within parenthesis local DB. Uh, parenthesis. Yeah, local DB. Hmm. After that backslash. Backslash other one. Mm. MS. SQL. Yeah. Without space. Yeah. Local DB again without space. Yeah. And click on test connection. OK, so I think there is. No SQL Server instance uh, installed. We first of all need to get that done. Uh, OK, Prabjo, you there? Okay. 
should i stop presenting yes for now you can okay all right okay so do you guys uh, have uh, any contact uh, of uh, the it support I don't think so. Uh, we need to raise the request because, uh, okay, first of all, tell me if you are using your personal machines or you are uh, logging in from the office laptop. Office machine. Office laptops. Okay, so we will need some permissions over there. The admin privileges are required for the installation to go ahead. So, Excuse me, Sakit. In, yes. my, in my laptop, the test connection was passed. So I think Urmila had given a uh, space between uh, the parenthesis part. So I think that's why her server didn't connect. Uh, OK, so let me put the server name in chat, which you can copy and paste and then check once again. Just copy and paste as it is. Just check your chat boxes. Yeah, the connection passed. So, Urmila, you can share your screen again. No space anywhere. Urmila, yeah. you can copy and paste the server name. It's your succeeded socket. I believe it succeeded for you also, Urmila, right? There is a connection that we can see. Fine. Uh, we would need SQL Server Management Studio also. And uh, let's check if we have the Visual Studio installed correctly. So if you can go to Start menu. And look for Visual Studio Installer. Start it. Meanwhile, you can uh, close your Visual Studio, which is open in background. OK, so click on modify. Sorry, yeah. OK, so make sure the checkbox for ASP.NET and web development is selected. Uh, okay. On the left hand side. Under web and cloud. OK, ASP.NET and Azure. Web development, then Azure development. Then web. .NET desktop development. OK, I can't see web. Um, uh, it's combined okay. with the first option, ASP.NET and web development. It's one okay, option. Okay, okay, all right. Scroll down so, further. Data storage is already selected. That's why your data connection got succeeded. Uh, select .NET cross-platform development. Scroll down further to see okay, if there is, is anything. This is the last. This is the last. Okay, so just click on modify. So uh, .NET data, .NET desktop, uh, then C++, Azure and C++, web plus plus, C++ is not needed. You can uncheck that. OK, Azure and web development, right? That's right, that's right. All right. And data processing already selected. Yeah, data storage and processing. Yeah. So modify. Yeah, click on modify. It may ask you for the admin password, but that's where we will require the support from the IT team. They just need to put in the password there, nothing else. 
think. And meanwhile, this is going, you can just minimize this mm -hmm. and open the browser. And search for SQL Server Management Studio download. Click on the first link. And here you have this download SSMS, right? Free download mm -hmm. for SQL Server Management Studio. Click on that link. Download. Uh, Urmila, can you copy that link and paste it on chat? Sure, sure. So how much time it takes over here depends on your internet connection speed. Around five to ten minutes max it should take with average connection speed. Formula, can you go to Visual Studio installer, which is going on? Yeah. Anyhow, we need to wait till this gets finished. After that, only we can start SQL Server installer. Uh, this has been done, I think. Yeah, so let it finish the download. OK. Installation here has to finish first in Visual Studio. After that, we can Achoo. start the installation for SSMS. OK. That is done. This is pending. Yeah, yeah. So just let it be there. OK, OK. I hope everyone has selected the right options for Visual Studio. Oh, can you repeat this option socket? Yes, yeah, sure. So first is uh, ASP.NET and web development. Second is Azure. Third is desktop development. Then data processing. And then cross .NET cross platform development. Total five options we selected.
Ya, yeah, okay sir. Done. Don't select anything other than these five options because otherwise it will take a lot of time to do the installation. Yeah. It's always good to set up everything before we actually start, right? So the next sessions will go smoothly. We won't be getting um, in from this setup. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, I think my internet connection is going really bad. It's going up okay. and down. So uh, it, it's it's saying that uh, it will uh, start only if I reboot the laptop. So I think I should go for that. Go ahead, go ahead. No problem. OK, OK, I'll do that in just a second after downloading the SSM uh, part. Just yes, sure, sure, sure. Sometimes, you know, the installation itself might have some dependency on some system component. That's where it uh, asks you to reboot. Saket, the installation for video, Visual Studio completed without any kind of password, password prompt. OK, that's good. So you already have the admin privileges on the local machine. All right. Uh, can you share your screen? Yeah, sure. Okay. Formula once she yeah, is yeah. done, maybe you can share the uh, screen once again. OK, yeah. So is my screen visible? Yes, Tusha. So the installer completed. This is this is what appeared after that. Okay, so you did that modification for Visual Studio Community, right? Sir? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, just click on modify once more. I just need to uh, not this one, uh, the community one, third one. Okay, so ASP.NET and Web Development, Azure Development, .NET Desktop Development. Scroll down. You have data storage and processing and cross that right. You can close this installer. And go to that setup and uh, start. Double click. Do I need to change the directory or anything? Sakit? Hello? Uh, no, just click on install. Do we have to open the setup only after the installer work is done? Yes. Because two installers cannot go together. Okay, Tushar, so you can unshare your screen. It will just complete in some time. Okay. Formula, you can share your screen. So is your installer thing is uh, completed? You are muted on Mila. Yeah, so it's showing this like. like uh, yeah, this. just just close the installer. OK. And uh, now you can uh, just start the SSM second. It's starting up, I guess. OK, yeah.
Yeah, the extra windows you can close actually. Uh, Sakit, for my SSMA setup, uh, it is required to restart your laptop. Go ahead. Yeah, Go okay. ahead. Uh, Sakit, I had a problem. I just discussed with you how to restart and reboot. I yeah. think uh, I should be joining this meeting with uh, my personal laptop so that uh, this laptop gets enough time to uh, download. Uh, easily. So, uh, could you please share the, this meeting link so that I can go to my personal laptop? I can uh, follow up also, and and by the same time, it can get uh, installed as well. Okay. So, just a moment. Should I put the meeting link in chat? You can copy that, right? Yeah, yeah, I can copy that. Here it is. Just check. So it's installed. Okay. So how do we test this uh, SSMS uh, installed correctly or not? Just to go to start and uh, type SSMS in the search box. And select Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. First time it will take some extra long time to start. Okay, that's good. Server, now, name. server name will be the same that we tried earlier uh, within parentheses. <clears throat> it, it's there in the chat box. You can copy and paste yeah, that. No, no, no. I, it actually doesn't get pasted. Okay. <laughs> Connect. Connected. So it's done. So how many how many of you are done with uh, both the installations? Just raise hands. So Shar is done. Urmila is done. I can see six people raising hands. Formula, you can unshare your screen. All right. 
What about others? I can see only six hands raised. It is getting installed. Okay. I'll be just rebooting and then start the uh, installation once I'll uh, join with the personal laptop. Just a second. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Guys, we can take a 10 minutes break over here. Meanwhile, I hope the installation for everyone will be completed. Uh, those who are done with the installation can actually take the break. Those uh, who are not done yet can uh, just monitor uh, the installation. And uh, once the installation is done, just uh, raise your hands so that I get to know how many of uh, you are done with the setup. Okay. So it's 10.20, we'll be resuming uh, once again at 10.30. So it's not actually a break, it's more about waiting for the installation to finish. Okay.
can anybody tell what are the next step after SS SSMS installation is done? I got disconnected. Uh, go to start. Uh, uh, have you opened it like uh, open it again? No, it's from all... where we need to open that. Can you please tell? What we yeah, need go, to search? Go to downloads and folders. Like go to folders into downloads. Okay. Uh, uh, downloads. Open that, open that .exe file. Have you finished installing this Microsoft uh, Visual Studio thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, I finished that. Yeah, now go to. Yeah, that is also file. done. Go to. Open this file. Like uh, what file? Uh, you have downloaded on file, right? SSMS thing. Open that file yeah. in downloads. Sorry, I'm not getting if you can share your screen like that will be easy. Screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah, I've done with this. You open it, right? Yeah. Yeah, then uh, it will show like th this, uh, like go to start menu and click SSMS, open this app. OK. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, it's open now. What yeah, what is next? And copy paste this server name in that uh, kind of like database name, something like it will show a pop up. Yeah. OK, the one in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. local DB. Just click OK, I guess. Yeah, done with this. What's next? Yeah, that's it. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. I am having a problem when I click on SSMS setup. It is asking me to enter admin username and password. Enter it on uh, enter JCM card light. Uh, admin credentials. Uh, 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 my account ni uh, ade uh, elevation sari report le don bande. Ah, eh mo mar. Hindi bolo yar. Hindi bhi samajh hai. Okay, so it is asking me to enter admin username and password. When I am trying to enter my username and password, it is saying the privileges no, are no. not enough. So it is asking for it an elevation. So you have to just click on OK. Like uh, it will ask that uh, do you want this is an elevated request or do you want to continue? Just write yes. All right, all right. I'll try yeah. that. Yeah. Siddharth, it was you, right? Uh, yes, yes, it is me. Uh, OK, can you share your screen? Yeah, sure. Is my screen visible? Yes, I can see. OK, so. Uh, I'm double double clicking on this and. Uh, can you be able to see the prompt? Uh, no. OK, so I'm getting a prompt and it is asking me to enter email and password. And mm -hmm. when I try to uh, enter my email and password, it is again saying it requests an elevation. When I click yes, it is saying you do not have the enough permissions. OK, so you have to actually uh, talk to the. 
uh, IT support uh, person, and uh, he will be basically putting in his own uh, user ID password credentials, and it will go ahead. Okay, okay. So your user ID doesn't have the local admin privileges on your laptop. Yes, yes. That is why you are not able to go through. All right, so I'll try contacting the IT support team now. Yes. It's just a matter of one minute only. They have to connect and put in their credentials. That's it. Yeah, okay. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I can see 15 hands raised till now. Still almost 50% people. Is it like uh, the installation is still going on or? You facing some issue? Oh uh, yes. Uh, due to less uh, internet connectivity, it is taking some time, but it is going. Okay. Up. No, no issues. No issues. Anybody needing some support can share screen and uh, I can guide you. Uh, yeah, it has been installed. SSMS and Visual Studio changes that we had to do. Okay. Can you please tell me again the next steps after installing okay. SMS, SSMS? Okay. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it is. Uh, so first go to start and look for Visual Studio installer. We'll just verify this first. Click on modify. OK, scroll down. OK, fine. This you can close. Visual Studio is done properly. Now yes. again, go to start and type SSMS. This? Yes, open it. Put the server name that I shared in the chat box earlier. Okay. Just copy and paste. Connect. That's it. Okay, uh, that was it. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. 
guys who are done, please raise your hands quickly. Your installation is also done, right? Just raise your hand. We still have around seven people for whom the installation is going on. Uh, hi, Saket. So uh, while this was hi. going on, there's a uh, there's some issue with uh, the lap with my laptop. So okay. I have connected with the IT. Department and they are getting it fixed. So I'll need okay. some more time. You can continue with this and I'll be back when it gets done. Okay, no problem. No yeah. problem. Thank you. The rest of the guys, please update your status. Amisha. Hello. Yes, Amisha. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, my installer is stuck at 69% and it's not moving like it's not. In, okay, just wait for a while. Yeah, like it's I been hope, like that for like seven to eight minutes now. I hope the laptop is not uh, hung, right? Uh, yeah, it's not. Okay, like just wait for some more time, happening. otherwise you can kill the task and start over again. I did that already. Okay, so is it the SQL Server? Uh, no, no, uh, it's the modification Visual that Studio? we have to do. Visual Studio. It may be taking some time because, uh, you know, the Visual Studio installer downloads all the components from internet. Okay. And if the internet speed is uh, fluctuating, it may take some time. Okay. So what you can do is uh, you can stop Visual Studio installer for now. Get the okay. SSMS installation done first. And uh, that is what we will need for today, right? Uh, oh. The v Visual Studio installer can run in background then. Okay, so I'll install it on it right yeah. now. Yeah. Siddha, what is your update? Yeah, Sakit, I tried contacting the IT uh, support team. So they said uh, they'll get back to me soon. So I'm waiting for them. Okay. Because I'm also uh, having problem with the Visual Studio because it is also asking me to enter the ID. Correct, correct. Uh, All admin, installers uh, will ask for the credentials. Uh, in fact, if you don't yes. have the admin rights. Yes, yes. So it, it might are you take, connected uh, to the Global Protect? Uh, yes, I am connected to the Global Protect, and also it says it uh, connected, um, but still I'm facing the problem. Okay. I don't think connection with the global product is needed because I am not connected to it. That can you try disconnecting from global product and try again? Yeah, yeah. Actually, global product is slowing down the internet connection. It limited mm -hmm. the SP. Oh, okay. So I'll I'll do that. I'll do that. What is your status, Sri Lari? Sir, actually, my internet is a bit slow. It's taking time. Okay. Navjot? Sriya? Sriya, what is your status? Yeah. yeah, I am on a call with the uh, IT department IT, and okay. I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll and get back to this as soon as it gets uh, fixed. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Samriddhi? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I just got a call from IT department saying that my Visual Studio code was not uh, installed properly. So mm -hmm. I just installed it, uh, re, uh, like re, uh, uninstalled it and then reinstalled it. And now okay. I have to go through all the processes again. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. So I just so Visual Studio, Visual Studio is not a worry today. That can go in the background. Just make sure you are done with SSMS first. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, that, that that has been done. I, I did it beforehand, so my executable file has been downloaded. But then oh. uh, I'm just going on with the Visual Studio, um, all the steps you said. So okay, I just okay. need to get a confirmation on that. So uh, what all uh, check marks we had to have for this uh, <clears throat> modifying? Visual Studio, right? Yeah, so uh, ASP.NET and web development, then right. Azure development, uh, Azure development. Then uh, desktop development with C++ has to be unticked. C++ is not needed. The other one is needed. Uh, dot, there sorry. are two, right? Desktop development and desktop development with C++. There are two entries, correct? Yeah, so dot .NET desktop development will be checked. Yes. Then, um, C++ then, not required. Then, then uh, data storage and processing. Um, data storage and processing. I'm not able to find it. Just scroll down. You will find it. Are you asking for? Yeah, I, that has been uh, checked already. And then .NET cross platform development. Correct. So it will be one, two, three, four, five. OK. Yes. Yeah, right. uh, so should I go for the download uh, portion or go for SSMID uh, installation right now? Uh, SSMS you should do first. You can okay. just hold this on. And once SSMS is done, you can uh, just click on install here. Okay, okay, I'll do that. OK, so I see almost 22 people are done with the installation. Others are fixing it. OK, so maybe we can start with the basic discussion and hopefully by the time we are done with the basic discussion, the installation of SSMS at least will be done for the remaining people as well. So guys, just uh, listen carefully. There will be a few questions to start with because there are many people from the comp science background already. Uh, I hope everyone must be aware of some basic terminology like. If I ask you what is data, can someone define? Well, technically it's streams of bytes, like very large okay. streams of uh, bytes together. OK, so that's more on the computer. Uh, I would say uh, the definition would be applicable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in general, if I say what is data? Do we need computers always for maintaining and managing information? Can I say some raw facts and numbers? Is what we call as data. Yeah. It could be as simple as something written on a piece of paper. Am I right? Yes. So anything. Which has got some. Usefulness somewhere. Some relevancy somewhere can be considered as data. Correct. Yeah. Now is data always meaningful? No. How do we decide whether the data item is meaningful or not? For example, if the data is unstructured, so then we okay. will have to process it or classify it. I have written a number on the screen. I hope it is visible. Yes. Can someone tell me what is this number? 98143. What is it? What is it representing? Can be a pin. It can be a pin. pin. 
first five digits of a phone number. So in general, can I say phone number? Yeah. Maybe first five, maybe last five, maybe in between. Yeah, yeah. Right. It could be an extension number also. It could be house number, flat number, something. Yes. What else? Amount. It could be an amount. What could else? be a train number. Train number. Okay. Account, bank account number. Bank account number. Customer ID. Last few digits of credit card, debit card. Okay, so maybe in general we can say card number. Yes. Roll number. It could be a roll number. That means it could be an employee ID as well. Right. It could be part of some ID like Aadhaar. Right. And this list is never ending. Am I right? These are all assumptions if I correct. Assumptions or guesses. Right? We are just saying that it could be this, but there is no concrete evidence that what is it? Is there any concrete evidence? No. No. Now. I put another data item here. What is it? OK, you might say it's my name. But location uh, in Delhi. Location in Delhi as well. Right? Many times you will find this name as the name of some property as also. Right? So again, there is no certainty here. What is this representing? Right? All assumptions. If you say it is my name, I may not have written this name with my name in mind. I may have written it as the name of the location, correct? So there is no certainty here with this kind of representation. But can I say these two items are actually data items? Yes, they are. Yes. Whatever you record in whatever form you record it, it is data. Correct. This is something I can say is in the raw format. Simply I can say it is raw data. Just like if I talk about grains of rice, wheat, that is raw food content, right? Can we consume raw wheat, raw rice? No, we cannot. We have to make it consumable by cooking it, if, if I'm correct. Yes? Yeah. Most of the food items we need to process in order to make it consumable. Correct? And cooked rice is something which is more meaningful than the grains. Is it correct? Yes. So, if I say this is represented like this, employee ID 98143, <coughs> sorry, first name as Sake. Can you tell me this is more meaningful compared to the earlier representation or not? Yes, it is more meaningful, obviously. Yes. Reason? We have got some context, right? And we are certain that, okay, this number is not just a number representing anything that we guess. Rather, it is precisely employee ID. Which employee whose first name is? Okay. So here, again, we are certain that this is not my name or location name or some property name. This is actually the name the first name of some employee whose ID is 98143. Am I right? Correct? Yes. Yeah. Still, this is more in unprocessed format only. This is not raw data, but still this is unprocessed. 
because this way I can collect millions of data items for millions of employees. The big MNCs may have millions of employees, right? I may have millions of data items like this. If 1 million employees are there, there will be 1 million combinations like this. Yes or no? Can I say that is very, very meaningful? No. If I look for more meaningful information, I need to process it further. Like, I may want how many employees are there in XYZ department, the finance department? How many employees are there in HR department? How many employees are there in technical department? And so on. Am I right? So, your organization is more into healthcare. I may also say there are few employees who are actually doctors or some sort of medical professionals, right? They can be pharmacists also, correct? They can be lab technicians, anything. I get more meaningful information out of that because they're, in today's world, no one has got time to read detailed information. If I talk about managers and higher authorities, higher management and all, they will not be interested in knowing the individual employee IDs and names of each and every employee. They just need summarized version, correct? Okay, I have 100 people in this department out of them, uh, 10 are highly skilled, highly trained, and they can lead the teams. So, okay, out of these 10, these are basically going to lead the teams. I'm going to make five teams or 10 teams, and uh, so and so number of uh, people will be there in each team. Decision making becomes much more easy and faster. Am I right? How do you present to someone about the sales figures? Is it like, okay, on day one, this salesperson sold these many items? Again, not only these many items. Day one, this salesperson sold this item. Again, day one, the, the same salesperson sold this item also. Is it like one? Entry for each of the sale that he has made is shown, or you just show the summarized version. This sales person did this much of sale. Maybe you can categorize the types of items uh, which have been sold the most by that sales person, right? So that you can find out in which type of item this sales person has got the skill. Am I right? Accordingly, I can assign him the further tasks. Meaningful? Yes. It could be a simple Excel sheet. It could be some professional report prepared by the ERP system. It could be uh, some dashboard created. It could be some chart created, which is showing me all the figures, right? Like if I look for the sales reports on the entire country basis, probably I divide the country in different regions and then I see, okay, what is the performance in North region, South region, uh, East region, West region, Central region, and so on, correct? That helps me find out how the things are going on, how the strategy is working or not working in different regions. Is there any region where I need to revise my strategy or it is overall revamp that needs to be done across all the regions or whatever? I will not be going through all the details because there might be millions of records of the sales, right? Correct. It's not going to be possible for someone to go through each and every single detail that probably would be managed by their ground level managers. Am I right? In fact, the individual person would be analyzing his own figures also, correct? So they would look at their own details, but they also will not look for each and every single detail, they'll be looking for summarized version only, which is relevant to them. Am I right? So when the data is processed and you get some summarized or what we call as the aggregated information, you say this is information. So 
there is a clear difference between data and information. Data is raw data or unprocessed data. It may not be completely raw. It may have some context, but it is still unprocessed. Detailed version. Each and every record, right? When you process it, when you get the aggregates, you say this is information based on which I can take my future decisions. I can make my future predictions. And based on those predictions, I can take my decisions. Am I right? OK, so I hope everyone is. Now clear about what is data and what is information. Data is not information or information is not just data. Yes, process data is information. There is a relation definitely, but. There we have to understand that it's not the same. There is a relation only, correct? Now tell me whether the data is important or not. It is because yes, that's the way how we look at the facts, right? What is going on? What has to be done in future? See, you have just passed out or you are about to be passed out from your colleges. What is important? data information, data or information in your case as a student. To mark sheet. What that mark sheet contain? Does it contain each and every detail like in uh, which year, which semester, in which subject, in which question you scored how much? Or is it the total aggregated marks? Aggregate. Because no one is interested in which question got how many marks, right? At the end, the interest is in how much total you scored, right? Say, suppose total of 100 is there out of 100, how much you scored? 60, 70, 80, 90, 85, 75, 78, whatever it is. Am I right? That's more important. Correct? Even if I need some detail like in a particular subject, which area is stronger for a particular person, which area is little weak or which area is moderate. I will not be actually drilling down through all the questions in the exam paper or something like that. I would be looking for a chart. Maybe a bar chart can help me, right? Yes or no? The longer the bar is, the stronger you are in that particular area. The shorter the bar is, you are weaker in that. Yes, you go for any certification exams. Probably that's how the scores are given. Right, OK, five or six sections are there which are representing different knowledge areas in that particular technology platform or something. If it is a technology certification and then it just shows which area is stronger, which area is weaker or which area is moderate. Am I right? And yeah. that is not for someone else. Maybe it is more for you to understand that, OK, this area you are weak in and you can improvise further by further doing some studies and research on it. Am I right? I may be good in everything, but not security. So I can probably focus more in the security area and then I can make myself strong in that area also. Purpose of the IT certifications, typically the technical certifications is not just to earn the credits, but it is more about, you know, making myself better by knowing in which area I am already strong, where I need not focus further and which area I am not very much strong and I need to focus more on that. And that's how I can improvise myself, right? So practically, it's not just a. Uh, credential there, correct, or credit over there. It's more about your own self-assessment as well. So point is data required because that is the basis for information. But then the information is the most important thing because the processed information is what, or processed data is what you will need the most. 
right? Correct. Okay, so data is important. How do we record the data? How it all started? In computers. Tables. Computers, if I talk about, it all started somewhere in 1970, 80, right? Not everyone was using the computers. These days, even a small shopkeeper next to your door also is using some sort of computing environment. It may be a mobile app. Mobile also is a small computer only, right? Even if it is not a smartphone, it's a feature phone, still it is a small computer, correct? Okay. <clears throat> it's that common these days. But if I talk about 60s, 70s, 80s, even big businesses were not having access to the computer systems. How they used to record the data? Data was Science. important at that time also. Physical books, ledgers, right? Files. Correct. Manually, they used to write it. Handwritten records used to be kept. You go to any government department, say, if you go to land records or something, you will still find so many files kept over there with papers becoming completely yellow, right? Very old things. But that's how the data was being maintained. Am I right? Data was always there. The time when the exchanges of the goods and anything else started, right? That barter system and all. Probably the data in some form is getting recorded somewhere. Yes or no? I gave yes. you two units, you gave me one unit. All this is being recorded right from very old ages. Yes? Because that is something which allows me to keep track of what I'm supposed to receive from the other party and what I'm supposed to give to some other party. Yes or no? Again, if I'm doing a business, I can find out whether I'm doing good or bad based on this information only. Correct? That's why the bookkeeping and accounting and all these things have started. Yes or no? I believe. When it comes to the personal expenses, there also, if we are looking for some proper planning and all, we do make some sort of Excel sheet or maybe at least on piece of paper, we record that, okay, this is what I got as salary and this is what I have spent, right? These are my plans. I need to save this much. In some way, you do some sort of recording for this also. It could be a simple mobile app also where you might be maintaining all this. I'm not talking about exactly in what form, in what format you are maintaining your data. I'm talking about you are maintaining your data in some way. Yes or no? At the end of the month, you can find out, okay, this much I uh, earned and this much I spent. This much is what is pending with me, correct? Yes. If you look at your bank statement also, that is also a kind of data and information only, right? Yes or no? There you yes. see debits and credits, which you can map to whatever you have recorded at your end and find out that everything is in sync. So everything is fine. Correct? Suppose you plan to buy home, let's say in next three years, you need to plan it right from today, correct? How much loan I would need, what will be my budget and all this, if you can actually plan today itself will help you. Maybe instead of three years, you will be able to plan for a, a home in next two years itself, right? If you plan well, if you do record your expenses somewhere, income and expenditure, if you maintain somewhere, it will help you in future, right? So in all cases, the data is going to be important. And it doesn't matter in what form you record it, correct? It has to be recorded, that's more important. So whether it is physical thing, or whether it is some logical thing like being maintained in some Excel sheets or something, right? 
Now, if I talk about the format in which we maintain all this, the most convenient format, regardless of how we are recording and what medium we are recording, is probably something what we call as tabular format. Am I right? On a piece of paper, also, if you're recording, most likely you maintain it in the form of tables. Excel sheet is a kind of a table only. Rows and columns are there, right? Two dimensional structure, correct? Yeah. And that is why when the computing environment was involved to record the data and process it further, the main format which was selected or finalized for the data storage was the tabular format only. These days we do have unstructured databases as well, but see, ultimately when we process them at the application level or we prepare the reports, that means the processed information, somehow we represent them all in tabular format only, or maybe some dashboard charts and all, correct? So that tabular format becomes the becomes one of the most important structure in order to man maintain and manage the data. Am I right? That's where yes. the term table comes in, I guess. Right? We discussed about data. We discussed about table now. Table is what? Something that consists of rows and rows and columns. Columns. A two dimensional structure. Rows represent the complete record, column represent one part or one component of that particular record. Like here, if I say this whole thing is record or row and employee ID, first name are columns. Am I right? Somehow, if we can pre decide what type of data I'm going to put in that specific column. Will it help or not? In terms of processing data, in terms of retrieving data, and in fact, in terms of storing data also, will it help or not? It does. Will. It helps in maintaining the consistency of data also. Suppose if one employee ID is like this, which is all numeric, the other employee ID is something like this, EEX124. This doesn't look consistent, right? This is more confusing. Yes or no? If I say that employee ID has to be numeric, it has to be numeric for all. Am I right? Yes. Correct? So that's where the data types also come in. And then I need to find out whether whatever information I'm putting is going into the storage medium with some rules, with some checks. Is that important or not? You go for a ticket, maybe some kind of airline reservation or railway reservation. You fill up some form, right? It could be an online form, it could be a physical form. Whoever basically accepts that in their system, the reservation system, do they verify whether you have put the correct entry or not? One basic example over here would be the reservation date cannot be less than today's date, current date. Am I right? I cannot book a ticket for a date which has been already passed. Today is 2nd Feb 22. I cannot book a ticket for 1st Feb 22. Yes. So do I need to put in some rules in order to check whether whatever data is getting recorded is getting recorded correctly or not? Do we need that or not? Yes, we do. So what we call that? Constraints rules and constraints, right? In general, we call them as validations also. Am I right? 
all important stuff, right? Now, when it comes to recording the data in the manual way, in the form of some books, ledgers and all, we think we would be having some very, very effective and structured approach towards accepting the data, or we would depend on the person, person capability. Person capability, right? Now there will be more chances of errors, right? If some human being is responsible to validate the data, he has to be very, very attentive and very, very careful, right? And suppose someone has worked for around seven plus hours. I mean, shift wise, if I talk about towards the end of the shift, most likely the person will get tired. The attentiveness, promptness will reduce. Yes or no? Yes. We are not machines, so that's very natural. And we may miss some of the checks. There will be human errors, right? Maybe later on they can be rectified, but that will increase the work. Yes or no? That will increase the efforts. And there can be a mess also at times, like a bank clerk who is basically processing the withdrawal request at the counter. Someone is withdrawing 10,000 rupees. By mistake, if he puts in one extra zero towards the end or one less zero towards the end, it will be a loss, correct? Either for the person or for the bank, there will be a loss. Yes or no? So, is this acceptable? No. Maybe with investigations it can be rectified, but then it will be time and efforts required, correct? There will be disputes that need to be raised and then that needs to be rectified. Sometimes it takes too long. That is where basically the computer systems help us by automating most of these tasks, am I right? And when there is an automation with some logic in place, logic will not listen anyone. It will just do what it has been instructed to do tirelessly because it's it's just code, correct? Code will never tire, will never exhaust. Yes or no? It will just keep on doing its job, correct? So that is where we need a proper system to manage all this. Now, before we get into that, there is another term that we need to understand. Wherever all this stuff is maintained and managed, that is what we call as database. In manual way, what is database? Maybe the ledger, the book in which I'm recording the information can be the database. Even the place at which all such ledgers are kept, the record room, also can be called as a database. Yes or no? Right? Record room is a kind of a database only. Correct? Yes. Okay. Now, next we are talking about the automation and its importance. In order to reduce the chances of human errors. We require that automation. That is where we require something called as DBMS. What does DBMS stand for? Database management database system. system. Database management system. <coughs> now that is a known thing for most of us. Am I right? Yeah. By name, it should be clear what it must be doing or what it has been designed for. It manages the database in an automated way. So it is actually a piece of software with some instructions already given into it, which just does the job of maintaining and managing the data tirelessly. The problem area that we identified with manual bookkeeping and all, that is something where it actually proves its worth, correct? Yes, initially you may need some efforts to be put in to set up the database system correctly. And once the database system is correctly set up, 
which you can verify with rigorous rounds of testing and all. You can then rely entirely on the DBMS system in order to manage and maintain your data, right? So what, right. what this DBMS actually is? A software which is designed for managing databases. Manage and maintain databases. Am I right? Yeah. What what kind of tooling they provide? What kind of support they provide? They do provide data types. They do provide the structure like tables, rows, columns. There are different names actually in different types or different versions of DBMS, right? Somewhere we call it as row and column. Somewhere it is something called as tuple and attributes. If I talk about RDBMS, precisely that's where we use these terms, right? Tuples and attributes. Tables are called as relations. Am I right? So let's not get into that terminology. In general, we need to understand what it is. Right? So it allows us to provide that structure. It allows us to work with the data types in order to restrict what type of data I will accept in a specific field. Right, and then it does provide me the option to create some rules and validations and constraints, which will allow me to check whatever data that is coming in is acceptable by the system as per the business requirement or not. Correct. Then, when it is a computerized database management system. We are storing it on some electronic device like hard disk or SSD or something. Correct? Maybe optical disk. Don't you think these devices can go bad at any time for various reasons? Like mag strong magnetic field damages the system. Sometimes power itself can be a problem, right? Power fluctuations. Sometimes it could be because of some natural calamity, flooding, earthquake. It could be a physical damage also at times. Yes. And ultimately it's a machine. So the machine can go bad at any point in time. Yes. With respect to the bookkeeping, probably there was a physical copy whose Further copies can be created. Three or four copies can be maintained at different locations, right? Don't you think we should be planning for similar stuff in case of the computerized management and maintenance of the database as well? Yes. So it does provide the backup and restore services also. Yes. Do we need this or not? Then sometimes we may have our database that needs to be accessible at various different network locations. And to make it pretty quick. Without network latency, we may want a copy of the data being maintained on each location's local server. So we might be needing some replication and mirroring services as well. Yes or no? OK, so that's what at the very high level the DBMS is all about. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Can you talk more about replication and mirroring services like okay. I so suppose I have one location, location A. OK, let's say this is one hospital. There is a different location called as location B. Maybe this is New York and this is New Jersey. OK. Yes. Now there was a patient who got re registered in location A, New York. 
whose name is XYZ, got a patient ID of 1, 1, 2, 4, 3. He got registered over here, was undergoing a long-term treatment, maybe a heart patient. He has to be always getting some checks done, right? Yes. There must be a doctor consulting him always. Maybe monthly checkups, maybe bi-weekly checkups or something like that. Yes or no? Yes. He relocates to New Jersey. Don't you think this patient now should be still getting the service because we have a local presence in that new location as well? Yes. He should not have any hiccups, right? We yes. can advise him that, okay, we do have our hospital there as well, and you can go and meet so-and-so doctor there. Now, this so-and-so doctor should not be doing all his uh, diagnosis right from the scratch. Rather, this doctor should be able to retrieve all the data from the previous source. And what are the previous doctor's comments or their diagnosis were there? Those all details should be accessible to the new doctor at location B, right? Yes. <clears throat> okay, now if these two locations are nearby, probably direct connectivity between these two servers is enough. The data can be retrieved pretty quickly. Location B server will send the request to location A and say, give me this uh, detail of this patient whose ID is so and so, right? A direct query going in. Query goes to location B server only, but location B server says, I don't have this data. Location A has it. Maybe here, the first two digits are basically the location code. By that, it filters and forwards the uh, query here, gets it executed here and gets the data. But if these two locations are at a distant location, like one hospital is in US and one hospital is in India, do you think the data retrieval will be with the same speed, yeah. it will take some time, right? Because yes. it has to come from a distance. Mm -hmm. Even if it is an electronic signal, the electronic signal has to travel. There will be a lag. And if the patient is critical, don't you think it can be fatal? It yes. could be life threatening. Mm -hmm. Right? So what is good? The moment this patient gets transferred here, the data of this patient should also be available here. And why, why like that? Because this patient may not be permanently moving, right? He mm -hmm. may have been visiting this location for say one month or two months. Okay. Maybe for some family reasons, maybe he just want to go to the next location for, you know, a vacation or something. We do that, right? We keep on traveling mm -hmm. for various reasons. So yes. why the data should be permanently transferred? Can't I say make this data whenever it is entered on location A, make this data available on all other locations. There may be a location C also immediately. There can be a little bit of latency in that particular case. Maybe when it is updated here, after five minutes it gets updated here. After 15 minutes, it gets updated here. I'm OK because mm -hmm. right now the patient is here only, right? That location, yes. OK, I don't mind if this time, this extra time is required to update the other locations, but a copy of whatever data is being recorded here is getting created here as well. It will help in future when he travels to other locations, right? So yes. that's on that location server itself, the query can be fulfilled instead of forwarding that query to the original base location. Am I right? Yes. Now, the automation of this process where the updates, inserts, deletes, whatever happening on one location, getting reflected in other locations also. This process is what we call as Okay. Right now, there are two different approaches for that. There is replication and there is mirroring. Okay, two different ways, two different algorithms with the help of which this data availability can be done. 
mirroring is something like it's not real time there will be schedules say every 2 hours every 3 hours whatever the modified data on each location is there will be reflected to other locations Okay. Replication is more real time. The moment the update happens here, the update is triggered for other locations as well. Then there may be lag, maybe because of the distance between mm -hmm. the location. That is something what we call as network latency. Understood? Yes, sir. Okay, so I hope this is now understood. So, with respect to databases, especially when we are working with a distributed system, we will most likely be needing the replication and mirroring as well. Correct? Yes, okay. And this by default gives me a kind of a backup also. If location A server gets uh, burned because of some fire, Still, I have my data available at location B and location C. Yes or no? Put together, these two kind of services are categorized under something called as high availability services. No matter what happens, my data will be highly available with these, right? Okay, now what is RDBMS? And how it is different from DBMS? Yes, anybody? So it is relational database mm -hmm. management and uh, like it stores, it's more in like uh, tabular form rather than just normal data. It's tabulated, and then um, like like we learned in college, so multiple things can be accessed through different commands at the same time. Uh, multiple tables can be accessed, and it can also be normalized into uh, according Absolute. to the necessary. Absolutely. And, so yeah. there are few things which are being carry forwarded from DBMS itself, like the data is stored in tabular form. There are data types. There are uh, columns and rows. There are backup restore services, replication mirroring services and all. Right. Whatever is there in DBMS is still here. In addition to that, instead of storing all information in one single table, what you can do is you can apply the normalization rules and split the data across multiple tables so that you avoid the redundancy, the unnecessary repetition of data, right? There is one yes. master data entry and there will be a related data entry multiple times going in. Like you go to Amazon, you make purchase for the first time. There is profile that is created for you, the user account and a profile associated with it. And whenever you make the purchase there onwards, the profile used is the same. Your user ID is recorded with every transaction, correct? But the order details are freshly created. Only that data goes to a separate table, correct? So the space which is required to store the data also gets reduced. Am I right? Simply, Dr. EF Cord came up with this design. He was a mathematician. Hence, he applied some basic mathematic rules. And based on which he came up with this theory, where the repeating data need not be recorded repeatedly. You record it once and it's reference you can manage in the detail information, right? OK, in detail information, the changing data I'll record along with one of the reference item from the master record I'll record there which will make the two tables or two storages related to each other, correct? And that's why the tables in RDBMSs are called as 
relations. Am I right? And based on this only, the records are called as pupils. And then the fields are called as attributes or properties. Usually attributes is the right term. Right, this, this all came in on the basis of a simple mathematical expression. If you see, I have A into X plus B into X plus C into X square. How I reduce this expression? Simple mathematical formula it is, right? I can take X as common. I can say multiplied with the non-repeating part goes inside parenthesis, right? A plus B plus maybe I can say C into X. Right? My expression gets simplified with this. My calculation also will be simplified with this. Instead of playing with big numbers directly from the beginning, I'll be playing initially with small numbers, right? And there is no difference between the two expressions. They are the same. With DBMS, probably we followed this strategy. With RDBMS, we are allowed to use this strategy. That's what Dr. EF Cord did. Now, this reducing algorithm they designed for the databases and that algorithm itself was named as the process of normalization, right? There are around five rules of no normalization. We'll not get into the details of how exactly each normalization works, which normalization level does what, that you will find on Google also, right? The entire process as well. But one thing for sure everyone must be aware of that whichever step you talk about, it talks about reduction of the data. Right? The non-repeating and repeating data needs to be split in all the steps, right? Step one, this type of data is split. Step two, the other type of data is split. Step three, the other type of data is split. Categories of the data items has been defined in different steps. But in all cases, you just focus on splitting the repeating and non-repeating data and nothing else. Am I right? That's what normalization is. Correct? First normal form, second normal form, third normal form. What, what all they are? They are about reducing the data, splitting the data. So you end up with multiple tables, even if you have started with one single big data set or big table. Right. And there is some reference of each table maintained in the other so that they are all related to each other. Again, when we talk about the relationships, we have one to one relationship. We have one to many relationship represented by infinity. And then we have many to many relationship as well. Right. Correct. For one record, there is one record in related table that is one to one. For one record, there is there are many records in the other table. That is called as one to many. So customer and order relation, if I talk about, it is usually one to many. This is the mostly used relation type, correct? In some cases, there would be many to many relations also. Like in a particular city, there might be multiple stores for multiple users, right? Let's say if I'm talking about electronics items. Definitely there are many customers, but then there are many stores as well, correct? That's where the common field will be city and there will be a many to many relation between stores and the customer table. Am I right? Based on the field called as city, city or location, whatever you call it. It could be pin code based as well at times, right? There is a possibility that within one area itself, there are 10, 15 stores, correct? Again, that will be many to many relation. So 
mostly use relation type is one to many. Sometimes this one is used, sometimes this one is also used. And with this, basically the DBMS is actually named as RDBMS. Rest all the things are similar to DBMS only. Both of them have the responsibility of providing the software to manage and maintain the database, providing the basic needs like backup restore and replication and mirroring services wherever required and make the data highly available whenever required. They come up with their own rules engine, validation engines and all. Constraints and everything, the basic needs already being solved. So there are less chances of human error, right? I'll not say zero chances because the person who is writing the logic, who is designing the database, that person himself or herself may make that mistake, right? So it's not 100% foolproof, but yes, if you have given enough time for thinking about the design, probably you end up with a system which can go for long. Flawless system, right? It won't allow any unwanted entry into your <coughs> database. Anytime. Make sense? Interesting. So, what is the role of SQL Server here? What is SQL Server? It's an RDBMS system by Microsoft. Product of Microsoft. Understand? So here we'll be taking a break. Once we come back from the break, we'll talk actually about this product, what SQL Server is. In detail, what all features it brings in, what all things we can do with it, what all relations it has with the similar products like Oracle, or MySQL or DB2 or something like that. Okay. So let's take a 20 minutes break. It's 1140 almost. So I'll resume at 12. And then we'll talk about this product SQL Server. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir.
Hey guys, welcome back. Shall we proceed? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so we are talking about the SQL Server as a product. So it actually was introduced by Microsoft in joint venture with Sybase. Uh, version one till version six point five were the product of this uh, joint venture. But then uh, from SQL Server 7.0, Microsoft built SQL Server on its own. Uh, the partnership with Sybase was broken. So they revamped the complete product, built from the scratch, and uh, came up with SQL Server 7, based on which SQL Server 2000 was introduced. Then uh, SQL Server 2005, 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2. We had SQL 2014, 2016. Then we had SQL Server 2019. And now SQL Server 22 also is there. Right. So basically, if you talk about SQL Server 7, that became a be benchmark, the core system. And with some additions, ultimately, SQL Server 2005 now can be considered as the base version and all subsequent versions just kept on improvising the existing product and coming up with new features new additions to it the core is still the one that was used with C sql server 2005 now sql server 2000 onwards it was not just the rdbms system provided along with sql server sql server had the RDBMS, which is also called as database engine in SQL Server. Then we had some other products also that were added to the family, like SQL Server Integration Services, SSIS, SQL Server Analytical Services or Analysis Services, SSAS and then SQL Server Reporting Services named as SQL Server, uh, in fact, SSRS. So this is complete suite by Microsoft since SQL Server 2000. And in fact, precisely SQL Server 2005 onwards. OK, so when you open SSMS, Like uh, while doing the installation and verification, we went through this uh, step, right? SQL Server Management Studio, we all opened. And then the login dialog comes in. So just confirming, are you sharing your screen? Is it not visible? No, it isn't. Let no, me unshare and share again. Yeah. Is it visible now? Yeah. Great. So this is what I just put down on the screen, what we discussed according to that. And this is what we get, right? This is the server detail that we put. Now here on the top, you might have noticed there is a drop down for server type as well. And there we have some options, right? Database engine, analysis services, reporting services, and integration services. This is what I've put on the whiteboard. So SQL Server, no more is just RDBMS, but it's a suite or family of products. Called a SQL Server suite. Do you get it? RDBMS yes. is typical RDBMS based on what we discussed before the break. SSIS integration service is a service that allows you to build some packages that pull in the data from different sources, not necessarily SQL Server, but the other sources as well. Could be flat file, could be Oracle, could be mainframe database, could be a NoSQL database. Providing some transformations on that 
doing aggregations and then placing the data into some SQL Server store, which will further be used either by SSRS or SSAS. SSAS is something which allows you to build multi-dimensional view of the data, which is useful in terms of doing analysis, analysis on the set of data that we have recorded. And then SSRS is a typical reporting tool. You don't need to get in the details of these three, just that we need to be aware of what these products are. So I hope everyone understood the purpose of each of the three products. Yes? Uh, can, you, can you tell about SSIS once again? SSIS is the integration service. So with integration, what do we mean? It could be a data source where the data is coming from SQL Server. It could be the database coming from Oracle. It could be some flat file. It could be some NoSQL store. Right? And then coming into one context, it could be like data coming from one of the source or two or three or four of the sources. Then applying transformations, aggregations. Or both as per the need. And then storing in SQL Server. In fact, again, here also it's not necessary that the data needs to be stored in SQL Server. But it could be any DBMS. Now, the analytical services can feed on this data, which is already processed up to great extent. Then further analytical services can be applied, analytical algorithms can be applied, and then more meaningful information we can achieve with it. SSRS is a typical reporting tool, which builds reports on either the raw data coming from our DBMS, or the data prepared by SSIS or the data prepared by SSAS. Understood? Yes. Yeah. Right, and this makes it look like some sort of workflow processing we might be doing. So yes, SSIS actually is a workflow engine only, specifically designed to work with the data coming from different data sources and going into different data targets. Got it? Yeah. OK, now while working with RDBMS, especially while developing and managing the databases, you will need the tool called as SSMS. What this stands for, we just installed it in the first session. SQL Server management, uh, management. management Studio. So that is an IDE integrated development environment for SQL Server RDBMS. And few of the things on SSIS, SSAS, and SSRS can also be managed from here. Okay. It uses the language called as T SQL to provide the access to the database. What is T SQL? T stands for transact and SQL is SQL language. What it stands for? Structured query language, right? Now you might say there is SQL language in almost every database, Oracle, MySQL, DB2. Most of the databases come with this. Yes or no? Yes, yes. The SQL, if you have noticed, seems to be pretty much similar across whichever database you work with. Correct? Like if I want to read all the columns and all the rows of a particular table named as XYZ, 
what will be my statement? Will it be like this? Select asterisk from XYZ. Yes or no? Yes. Within Oracle, within DB2, within MySQL or within SQL Server, this is all the same. So the basic operations which are required to insert, update, delete, and select the data, basically what we call as CRUD operations, <coughs> are all standardized by an organization called as NSI. What it stands for? American National Standards Institute. This is the organization which has created a standardized version of SQL, which every DBMS and RDBMS has to support, making it easier for the database developers to work with any database. And basically, if one developer has got the experience of one database type from one vendor, working on the other database type from another vendor should not be a big challenge for him as far as he is doing just the CRUD operations. For that smoothless transition, basically, NSI came up with the standardized version of SQL, which is actually named as NSI SQL or just SQL. <coughs> Understood? And this is something which every database provider, which is DBMS or RDBMS, has to support. And that is why you see a lot of similar kind of statements being used across the database engines. Do you get that? Yes. OK. What is T SQL? T SQL is the flavor of SQL language, which is based on NSI SQL, but extends the capability of NSI SQL. Because only with NSI SQL, all of the operations are not possible. The management operations are not possible because NSI SQL focuses more on CRUD operations, create, retrieve, update, delete. We discuss that. Yes or no? So what about backup and restore services? What about replication and mirroring services? What about querying from other SQL servers. What about querying from other database types? Those features are not supported just by NSI SQL. What about programmability support? Means where we can do some logical processing. We can use some programming constructs like if, if else, or some looping constructs like while, or some kind of switch case kind of constructs. or some code which need to execute based on the input coming from some parameters. How do we write that? NSI SQL allows us to write independent SQL statements. NSI SQL doesn't allow us to write programming constructs. To do that in SQL Server, Microsoft has come up with a language called as Transact SQL, which extends NSI SQL. So whatever is there in NSI SQL is there in T-SQL, plus the additional features where there are limitations on NSI SQL. Similar thing in Oracle is achieved by using the language called as PL SQL. What this stands for? Programming language, structured query language. So where again, SQL part is NSI SQL only, programming language, that is an extension to the NSI SQL. And most of the DBMS and RDBMS systems have their own version of the SQL language like that. Do you get it? 
Yes, Though it's not mandatory for the database vendors to come up with their own versions of the SQL language. What is mandatory is they should provide NCI SQL support at least. And then it is voluntary for them to decide whether they want to provide only NCI SQL or they want to provide the extended version of this. Oracle has decided to extend by going with PL SQL and SQL Server has decided to go with T-SQL by uh, to provide the extensions. You get it? Yes. OK, so this is the language that our focus is going to be entirely on all the sessions that are yet to come for today's uh, training. OK, so. Let's start with our first few examples on the same. It all starts with how do I create a database, right? Because database is the master file which will contain all of my work. Like what are tables I create? Tables will contain rows and columns. Columns will have the data types, right? And then later on when I make use of some programming constructs like procedures, functions, triggers, cursors, that all goes inside the database. The database is like a container, a master file, which will hold all of my database related work. Got my point? Yes. Where do I create database? Is it in database engine? Is it in SSIS, SSAS, or SSRS? If you have noticed, SSIS, SSAS, SSRS are all the products basically to provide the information version of the data by processing the raw data. Am I right? Yeah. So if I'm looking to build my database, should I be building in these products? No. If I'm looking to build my database, which is going to hold my raw content, raw data, it has to be database engine. Yes or no? Yes. So the server type selected over here has to be database engine, right? Now, have we installed SQL Server on our machines? No, we installed the SSMS tool only, correct? Yes. The other installation we did was for SQL, uh, I mean Visual Studio, right? From Visual Studio installer, we got Visual Studio installed, yes or no? Yeah. Yep. Why do we need this Visual Studio? Not for today's work, but mainly for the upcoming sessions where we will be writing some .NET code, correct? Right. Yes. If I go to modify here, what were the selections we made? ASP.NET and Web Development. Azure development, then .NET desktop development, then data storage and processing, and finally .NET cross-platform development. Five items we selected. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Now, if we go with all these selections one by one, in order to understand what exactly they are. We'll get to know how we are going to get SQL Server. ASP.NET and Web Development by name, what do you understand? There is some uh, basic description also here. If you hover on it, complete extended version it shows. What it is showing, just read that. 
build web applications using asp.net core asp.net and standards based web technologies using or including html javascript css and json also includes tools for containerizing your applications using or including docker support right what do you get from this is it something to do with the data or database doesn't look like it's more about website and web application development am i right yeah azure development by name first of all what is azure azure as microsoft cloud technology platform right yes so if you just go by the name you can make out that this must be something to do with the azure based applications and resources being developed right and that is the same thing confirmed by the description here yes or no yes i have some extra selections over here because i do some work on other things as well other than what we have selected so let's ignore that focus on what you selected the next thing that you selected was dotnet desktop development am i right what this must be for dotnet based windows or desktop applications like console application then winforms application wpf application workflow foundation or wcf applications windows communication foundation that allows you to build client server and distributed applications using the languages like c sharp visual basic f sharp and then based on dotnet core or dotnet framework understood what are desktop applications the locally installed application are desktop applications locally installed not on mobile phone but on computer systems like ssms or visual studio itself are the examples of desktop application if you talk about adobe reader or microsoft office which is installed locally on your machine these are all windows applications do you get that browser is a locally installed desktop application do you get that Yes or no? Yes, sir. <clears throat> There was one option: .NET cross-platform development. By name, what do you guess? Different .NET applications which can be built and deployed and used on different types of systems, which may be Windows-based, Linux-based, Mac OS-based. again they could be 32 bit or 64 bit systems that's why we say it's cross platform dotnet core actually brought in the cross platform development capability for dotnet developers about which we will learn in detail tomorrow how dotnet core evolved or dotnet cross platform evolved but for now what is important is here we create applications which can run on all the popular systems across the world both in 32 bit and 64 bit modes understood with these four templates can you tell me if you have got some idea how we are going to get working with sql server i don't think so the most nearest thing which i can understand to work with or to use sql server seems to be data storage and processing see data is coming in the name data storage basically the icon is something like a database only and if you see the description it says this allows you to connect develop and test data solutions with sql server and then some other products like sql azure data lake or big data hadoop 
point is here in order to connect and develop applications we don't require full fledged sql server product installed we have a lightweight version which doesn't require any license as well that can be used for learning and even development purposes the limitation is it cannot have a database more than 2 gb in size but during development and testing we may not need that big size right we just want the basic structure to be built with some basic records being added in order to test the application functionality so there is an addition of sql server called as sql server express addition that is installed automatically when we select this tick box what does it mean though we have not installed sql server product we still have a sql server database engine installed on our machine which is made available by this visual studio component data storage and processing do you get that do you get yes, that sir. it gets installed as a named instance of sql server and that named instance has got a name what i put into the chat earlier local db slash ms sql local db understood yes 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 sir sql server usually provides two authentication modes now with azure being integrated there are few more in fact but let's avoid azure as of now let's assume there is no azure so we have two modes windows authentication and sql server authentication what is the difference between two windows authentication uses your currently logged in user to your windows machine when you start up your windows machine do you log in or not yes sir it may be a local user created on the machine or it can be a domain user also organizational user right so windows authentication basically is capable of dealing with both cases understood mm -hmm. here you can see with windows authentication it shows the machine name followed by slash followed by username so it knows where to get this user authentication request forwarded to whether it is local machine or whether it is an active directory domain server on the network if the domain name is mentioned instead of machine name the request will go to the domain server do you get it yes sir we'll check whether this is a authenticated user by the respective authority local machine or domain server or not if yes allow login if not reject login what is sql authentication here sql server maintains the list of users and passwords credentials so i have to provide a user id and password explicitly over here which will be validated by sql server into itself it stores all this information in the database system database basically named as master so it just goes back there and queries the master database to check whether this login credential combination submitted by the user is correct or not if found correct login if not found or if it is incorrect login gets denied understood if you are using a windows based machine on a windows network windows authentication is what is recommended but if you are using mac os or linux the windows authentication will not be available because the system is not a windows system that's where you have to go back to sql authentication understood <clears throat> yes sir what do you think uh, what will be 
out of these two modes, what will be more secure? Windows authentication or SQL authentication? SQL authentication. Why do you think so? I think so because um, SQL authentication will be more uh, directed towards uh, an overround protection, not just only Windows machines. So you said because it is not available in Mac as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Windows authentication is not available in Mac because Windows authentication won't be able to protect against some, uh, won't be able to authenticate uh, people logging into through Mac. So SQL authentication is more all around. That's why I think it's more secure. Okay, so this is actually little confusing thing over here. The thing is, if I'm using a Windows based environment entirely, my server is Windows, my client is Windows, Windows authentication is the most secure authentication here. Because if I don't get the access to the machine itself, forget about SQL Server giving me the access. First, I need to log into machine, right? Yeah. If I'm not able to log in, simply SQL Server can not be used as well, correct? SQL authentication requires me to provide username, password, both in clear text format. Issue here is that can be tracked and with this tracking, it can be hacked also. It's more vulnerable. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, yes. Now coming to the point, what would happen when I'm working with Linux or Mac? client. If it is Linux or Mac as a client, my server can still be there on Windows machine. And Linux or Mac as a client can still support Windows authentication. I can connect those machines into the domain managed by the Windows server, Active Directory server, and there also the Windows authentication will be able to be used. Yeah, if I install SQL Server, on Linux machine, Linux domain, or Mac OS domain. In that case, I will not be having the support for Windows authentication because there is no Active Directory service involved in that. Do you get it? The recommended option is if you want to use SQL Server, you want to set up a server, that server has to be ideally on Windows Server and which itself might be Active Directory Server as well, or a dedicated Active Directory Server could be there. The best option for best security is having a separate dedicated Active Directory Domain Server, and then a different Windows Server on which SQL Server is installed, so that if one of the machine is compromised, the other doesn't get compromised directly. Understood? Yes, sir. If I go with Azure, Azure has got Azure Active Directory Service. That is the cloud version of Windows Server Active Directory Services. OK, so the same advantage which I have with Windows authentication, I can have with Azure Active Directory also. There are three different options for that as well. So once you learn Azure, probably you will get the answer about how the three different modes can be used. Do you get it? In that case, regardless of the machine type, my user authentication and authorization will be taken care of by Azure Active Directory rather than being taken care of by any specific server. So it will not matter whether my SQL server is installed on Windows or Linux or Mac provides me Windows authentication kind of capability on non-Windows machines as well. More benefits with cloud, right? Yes? Yes? Yes, sir. Uh, so for so now, or 
Yeah. So, so, so but uh, in that case, why don't they just rename it from Windows Authenticator to Universal Authentication? I mean, it's a little confusing if you call it Windows Authenticator. Right. Authentication. Correct. I was expecting this uh, question over here. There are a few things actually. Uh, Windows Authentication is something which is specific to Windows only. It's not actually universal. Your server has to be a Windows server, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And the universal one that you are talking about is now driven by Azure Active Directory. So they call it as Azure Active Directory authentication. Understood. So okay. they are working towards what you just said, but then there are legacy applications which are using the databases created some 10, 15, 20 years back. They will not be upgrading their application just because they want to change from uh, one type of system to another type of system, right? Until and unless total system overall is not done, they won't be going with it. So if they change this terminology in the newer versions, the older systems will stop working or will they will break. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is the reason why they are still continuing with the older options also. That is Windows authentication and SQL authentication. Got it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so for now, for local development, that means the database is going to be developed, designed on my local machine. I have to go with Windows authentication. Server name, everyone knows. It will be the consistent for all of us, right? Local DB slash MS SQL local DB. For your reference, it's there in the chat window as well. Make sure authentication mode is selected as Windows authentication. Server type is selected as database engine and click on connect. And you should be in. Yes or no? Yes. What next? In order to do anything here, the first thing I need to have is a database in place. Am I right? Yeah. The first question is how do I create a database, correct? If I go to databases, in your case, this list must be completely empty. Just check. It may not be showing any of these databases, right? Yes. Let me get some of the non required databases deleted. OK. Question is how do I create my own database here? So can you locate the toolbar here? There must be an option called as new query. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Click on that option new query. So on the right hand side, you get an editor. Like this. Everyone able to get this? Yep. Yes. Yes. Sir. Type a statement here. Create what we want to create. Database. Then followed by the name of the database. Let's say I call this as Providence DB. On the next line, put a statement called as go, which is like end of the batch. There may be more than one statements. So I want all of the statements to go to the server together. There are some statements which cannot be run as a batch. They have to be run alone. They are also after such statements, we need to put a go statement. Then select this code and click on execute button. If you just want to compile to check the syntax and all, there is parse button over here with the tick mark symbol. It will just compile. 
and let you know if there is any error syntactically. Execute not only compiles but actually executes the statement. If you click on execute twice, I mean more than once, you may get an error like this. What it is saying, database providence DB already exists. Choose a different database name. The reason I ran it second time. First time when I ran it, it already did create a database named as providence DB for me. Yes or no? Yes, yes, sir. As it showed, command completed successfully, correct? Yes, sir. In order to switch to the context of this database, I'll put the statement use followed by the database name providence DB followed by the go statement. Then select these two lines. Only the selected code runs. This way. So the context has been changed. You can see here also. It shows providence DB, right? Yes, sir. And then on the left hand side object explorer window, just right click on databases and select refresh. Your Providence DB database must be visible in the database list. If you expand it, it just shows you some of the items that the database can hold within it. Just verify if you are able to get the same thing or not. Where is refresh? Yes. Sir. Just right click on databases folder and select refresh. Or else you can just select databases and click this refresh button. Providence DB must be available. Yes. Yes, it is. Everyone able to see this? Yeah. Yes. What does this mean? A database is successfully created. created. Excuse me, Sakit. Yes. I'm not able to see because when I'm writing use Providence DB and uh, yeah, compiling it, it's showing that Providence DB does not exist. Uh, that means your create database statement is not executed. So no, just go that back. That is executed this. successfully. That is done. Uh, you might have just click on parse, not execute. Okay. You have to click execute. Parse will just compile, will not run it. Yeah, I've That's done it. that also. Still, it's not happening. Can you share your screen? Let yeah. Me see. Okay. Um, I think because you are sharing your screen, I'm not able to get that option. Uh, there must be a button just before the leave button. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Even if someone is sharing, uh, once you share, your screen becomes visible. OK, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Yeah, so here it's showing it's already exists because I've done execute and now I don't it's not working. Okay, just select use providence db go and click on execute. It has already worked actually. Okay. So yeah, if yeah. you see on the top, the drop down already is showing providence db, right? Yeah. So yeah. now if you right click on databases and select refresh, 
your database must be visible as well. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. So you may have missed the execute option earlier and yeah. then while talking you may have clicked it so it got created. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So I hope everyone understands the difference here between the parsing and execution. Parsing will just compile for syntax errors, whereas execute will compile as well as execute. It's like a command that we have written here, right? So that command will work when we say execute, not just parse. Clear? Yeah? Yes, sir. Next thing I want to do is I want to create a table over here. So how do I create a table? I'll say create. What I want to create is table followed by the name of the table. Let's say I want to name this table as departments. Create table departments, but then when I create a table, don't you think I need to give the details of which all columns will be there along with their data types and constraints, if any? What do you think? We need, right? Yes. So put the normal parentheses, the round brackets. And here goes the first field name, let's say, which is going to be named as department number. Followed by space, followed by the data type. Which decides what type of data this field is going to. Allow. I want a constraint over here named as primary key. What does that mean? What does primary key mean? Unique, unique identity. There won't be null. Yeah. There won't be any null allowed in this field, and it has to be completely unique. unique. So if one value is assigned, that value cannot be reassigned to any other record for this particular field, right? Behind scenes, it builds an index also on this field. Unique index. And I say the next field. Is D name. Which is of type N where care. With the maximum length of 50 characters. Having a constraint called as not null. What do you understand by this whole statement? D name is the name of the field. What is N where care? Just like int it's a specifier showing it some string character. Come again. Uh, just like int it's an uh, data type specifier, I guess. So what what is n worker data type? Uh, it shows like uh, a string of characters or something of max size 50. Yes. Then there is a data type called as varchar also. What is the difference between varchar and n varchar? There is a difference of size between varchar and n varchar. And what is that difference? Vatcar, I think it stores around uh, it stores more data around 8 bit, I think. And N Varcar stores uh, about 2 bytes per character. Something like that. Varcar is uh, 8 bit, so it is 1 byte and N Varcar is 2 bytes. OK. And why do you think that these two data types are created? Mm. You can see there is care and n care also, text and n text also, right? So these are the three basic data types which supports the character input. And then there are n versions of these three as well. Care has got n care, where care has got n where care, text has got n text. 
these three data types on the first line are basically supporting only the ASCII character set 0 to 127. Everyone is aware of ASCII? Yes. Yes. Something called as basic character set, right? Which usually targets only the English language, correct? Yes. But the way how the applications are being built these days, do you think only English language support is enough? No. Most of the applications are multilingual, correct? Be it website, be it web application, be it mobile app, be it desktop application, whatever it is, most of them are multilingual, correct? They not only show the user interface in different languages, but they do accept the input also in different languages, correct? Yes. Don't you think only ASCII will not be capable of storing the data which is in a different language? Because ASCII stores only English language information. We need some extra space to store the characters along with some extra information that defines which language that character has to follow. A in English might be something else in some regional language, right? So don't you think I need to store the language information as well along with the character A? Tell me quickly. Yes, sir. Then only I'll be able yes. to see the input in that specific language. Am I right? Yes. So be it Hindi, be it French, be it Japanese, be it Telugu, be it any, any other language, anything other than English. Correct? So that is where the N version come in. N care, N var care, N text. These are all called as Unicode data types. What they are called as? Unicode data types. So Unicode. I have a question. Uh, yes. So uh, shifting from uh, var care to N var care, how many yes. more characters can we store? How or in how many more? Num in terms yes. of number of characters, right? Yes, sir. Same as ASCII only. There will be no change. It is going to use one extra byte to store the language information, not for the data itself. Data will consume one byte and the second extra byte will be consumed for storing the language information. Do you get it? Uh, yes, sir. So if there is a length of 50 characters provided to Varcar, what that mean? You can store up to a maximum of 50 characters in that field. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Which will occupy 50 bytes, correct? Yep. And Varcar 50 also is going to do the same thing. It will allow only 50 characters. But one difference, it will occupy 100 bytes because each character is going to have one extra byte to store the language information. Do you get it? Yes, sir. So technically, in terms of number of bytes, it will still number of characters, it will still remain the same. Varcar 50 and Nvarcar 50 in terms of length of the data will remain the same. So uh, I have another question. Yes. Uh, so, so the byte that actually uh, stores the language information. So is yes. that byte going to be same for all the characters in a particular language? For example, all the characters in English language will have the same language storage byte or Correct. will there be a difference? Because in languages like Chinese, uh, there are more than 100,000 characters. So we can see that the other character byte can actually store only from 0 to 255. So we can't yes. accommodate, accommodate all of those no, characters so using. There, there it uses the combination in terms of the lang uh, that extra byte itself. But when I say language information, it is not just the language name. 
it is all about specific to that language so you are right like chinese has got more than 100 characters right so that extended character support is what this unicode gives understand yes it uses that extra byte to store that extra information so a combined with x gives me one chinese letter a combined with y gives me another chinese letter that all is supported here so as of now 0 to 255 characters basically are capable enough to store all the languages which are being used in the world right if any new language comes which comes up with even further number of characters probably that's where this may not be enough that's where maybe another uh encoding will be required beyond unicode understood yep the language that exist as of today are all within the range of the 0 to 255 characters understood yes sir so this is something where i can put the term called as extended character set support okay now what is the difference between char and var char it will be the same between n, n char and n var char also right if we can answer the first question this is going to be the same char of 10 and n var char oh, sorry var char of 10 what is the difference between these two char of 10 will reserve 10 bytes 5 6 7 8 9 ten. whereas var char will not do any reservation at all so with char 10 if i say there is a word called as hello practically it is occupying only 5 bytes but still the overall memory occupancy will be of 10 bytes what it does is it fills all the remaining places with space it looks like underscore but that's the way how we represent a space right otherwise space is not visible so technically it still occupies 10 bytes and then this hello that is stored is not same as the word hello if we compare this hello with this what is stored it will not match because here it is not hello it is hello space 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 understood yes this seems to be useful when i am using a field which is going to have some consistency in terms of the length of the characters each of the value is supposed to have let's say six characters or eight characters every record will have eight characters for this field then i can i should actually use char that is more efficient because it pre creates the spaces for me it doesn't need to wait for the space allocation or memory allocation something like reserve space is there so i just need to go and put the data in the reserve space do you get it yes sir and because all of the values in that field across all records will have the same number of characters the retrieval also will be easy and faster and comparisons will also be easy and faster 
there will be no inconsistency or mismatch understood yes whereas if i don't know or if i'm not sure that the same number of characters will be there the number of characters may be 2 or 20 at different times i should not go for cap that is going to waste the memory space for me yes or no if only two characters are put the remaining eight characters are being wasted the storage is still required though the actual data is of just two bytes so in such cases where number of characters may vary i should not use char i should go for var char so if it is this hello here i'll go for var char it will get one byte reserved for each of the character and the moment it doesn't find any more characters it will just stop there 10 is still the size what does 10 signifies then it signifies that maximum of 10 characters are allowed in this field but it may have zero characters also 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 as well and based on how many characters actually are put the memory consumption will be accordingly decided so here it will occupy only 5 bytes what is more efficient in terms of storage bar gar gar Market. So if I talk about employee name, address, phone number, maybe not phone number, but yeah, name, address, city, uh, state, and all. What do you think? What is the right data type for it? Car or where car? Do you agree? Where car. If I say where car. Yes, sir. Yes. But if I talk about, let's say, employee code, which is like E one zero zero two, E one zero zero three, then car, car because it is fixed. Correct. So I hope everyone understood when to use which one, right? What is text? Car and where car allow you to have. maximum characters up to 2000 characters if you have a field which is going to have more than 2000 characters into it char and var char will not be enough let's say you have 4 gb of data to be stored in fact 2 gb not 4 gb then you go for text and text behaves just like var char only it occupies the space for the actual data it's not like char understood behavior is that of var char but it has got more data supported whereas var char and char supports only data up to 2000 characters in length do you get it yes sir so can you please give an example for text okay so suppose if i am building a portal like nokri.com and i am scanning the entire resume converting it into text and that text i want to put into a field we have ocr devices right which can do that for us yes converting the complete image into text and store the data as text some resumes may be 8 to 10 pages long as well right yes the person with more and more experience will have bigger and bigger resume correct yes do you think care and where care would be enough to support this no if i talk about product catalog in terms of e-commerce e website do you think care where care would be sufficient no that is where i would need text correct okay now how they relate to this 
exactly same behavior of CAR is simulated by NCAR. Just that instead of supporting only ASCII characters, it supports Unicode. Same is the case between varchar and invarchar, text and in text. Understood? Understood? Yes, sir. Yes. Let's go back here to SSMS and put further things here. Mama. Here I say the next field is location. And where care. 50 and I don't have any constraint over here. Why the constraints are required by the way? To ensure the integrity of the data, right? Correctness of the data. Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay, then I say go. Oh, select this much of code and first parse it to see syntactically all well and then click on execute. Only once. Your table is created. If you use this stored procedure, system stored procedure, SP underscore tables, followed by the name of the tables going in quotes, it just shows you the table is actually created. Which database? Who is the owner? Basically, this is the default schema. Then table name, type of the table, and any remarks if, if provided. If you want to see more details about it, you can use another system stored procedure. SP underscore help. Followed by the object name. In our case table name. Select and execute. A lot of details it provides. Including the details for constraints and all. Yes. So then the simplest way to find this out is our select statement. Select asterisk from apartments. Execute. Here it shows me the table structure according to what we have provided. There is no data, of course, because we have not added any data as yet. That's okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Can I see that an object explorer? Yes, of course. Right click on Providence DB database. Click refresh first. And then. Here you expand Providence DB tables and you should see the table departments. If you expand it further, you get some options like columns, keys, constraints, etc. So if I expand columns, it shows me columns with some more metadata. Keys show me which key has been created. And constraints, if any named constraints are there, those will be visible here. We have created constraints, but those are not named. That's why constraints right now is empty. No triggers created, no indexes created explicitly. But I told you when you create a primary key, by default, there is a unique index created. So it shows me one index over here based on the primary key. And because there is an index, basically there are some statistics also that has been created here, which basically shows me the effectiveness of the index. Like where the index is used and how it makes the table perform better whenever the query is working on this table based on the index provided. 
So that's more of an advanced feature. You will learn it later. How to use statistics, how to do the performance tuning and all. Right? But now it is just for your information. So graphically also we can see this. Not only that, we can actually build the database table, everything graphically also. We don't need to write the commands every time. This looks good. If I have two to three fields, maybe up to 10 fields, but if I have very complex system to be built, my tables may have 15, 20 fields, 30 fields also at time. Then writing the code probably may lead to more errors. Yes or no? Chances of typo are more. Yes or no? That is yes. where I may need some designer support, some automation support. Correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But that also we'll see the designer use, but that will be after the lunch break. So it's uh, 1.15. We'll resume our session at 2.15, exactly after one hour. And we will see the further things where, first of all, we'll get to understand how to use the designer for doing whatever we did so far. Maybe till that time, what you can do is you can just right click your Providence DB database and select delete. Close existing connections checkbox must be selected and then click on OK. So I'll redo everything, but with the help of a designer. Got it? Yes, sir. OK, so see you at 2.15. I hope you have enjoyed the session so far. Purposefully yes, going little slow so that everyone is on the same level. OK? Yes. OK, sir. Sakit, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so if we develop web applications, then we generally use uh, SQL Server or uh, some other databases to store data. Correct. Correct. But if we develop native applications like desktop applications or Windows native applications, then how can we store the data permanently? You can still use the databases like SQL or Oracle without any problem. OK, OK. Right, so it, uh, I mean exactly which type of database system I should use depends on what kind of data I have. Okay. So type of application will never define it. It will be the requirement of the application in terms of what kind of data it is working with. OK, Got it. type of application can be anything. It could be mobile application also. It could be web application. It could be Windows desktop application. It mm. could be native Linux or native Mac application also. Understood? Yeah, yes. Any more questions? OK, so let's resume at 215, 215. OK? Yes, sir. OK, sir.